Well, Patrick, uh, great to see you. Hi, John. Great to see you too. Um, so uh, we're going to have uh, about an hour to discuss our worldviews, our, our thoughts on yeah. foreign policy, on Biden, and uh, I think yeah. uh, weave together um, uh, a conversation about uh, history, theory, politics, uh, Biden uh, era foreign policy. Um, I'll just start introducing myself, then you might do the same, then I'll say a few words about uh, liberal internationalism and FDR, and, and we can get right. started. I, I'm John Eikenberry. I teach at Princeton University. I'm a, a scholar of international relations, American foreign policy, grand strategy, very interested in um, uh, intellectual traditions of thinking in international relations, social theory. Uh, and in particular, I've been uh, working on trying to reconstruct the liberal international tradition and assess its continued relevance for today's complex, a messy world. Hi, uh, I'm Professor Patrick Porter, uh, Professor of International Security at the University of Birmingham. I'm very interested in a lot of the, the things John's interested in. And in fact, one of the reasons I am interested is through John's work. Uh, I, in particular, am drawn towards realism both as an intellectual as a set of practices and the whole tradition of real politique. Uh, and I try, I'm sort of trying to work out really over time a theory of classical realism, or at least to try and excavate and keep the flame alive. And uh, my most recent book is a critique of the notion of liberal order. And I'm now doing some work on uh, America's war in Iraq and something I've got to get out of my system uh, and the Thucydides trap and various other obsessions. So it's great to be here. Great, Patrick. Um... Well, um, why don't we start with with just a, a little bit of a provocation and have you react to mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, both the specific piece in the current issue of, of foreign policy, but also the book and the argument. Uh, I, I, one, one thing I'm trying to do, I'd be very interested in your thoughts, is, uh, is, is try to step back from the current debate about liberalism and realism and look at liberalism across the uh, decades and indeed the centuries to see what what it has to offer. In my book, I try to uh, show that that uh, a couple of different things. One is that there's a, a long tradition. Uh, liberal internationalism didn't begin in 1989, nor even in 1945, but but is a longer tradition that has lots of different compete pieces to it. We know of kind of laissez-faire li liberalism. We know of a, 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 a social de democratic liberalism, but the strands that have uh, uh, been woven together and frayed and then rewoven together over the decades uh, and connected in various complex ways that I think we'll talk about to uh, power politics, to states, to uh, systems of hegemony and anarchy. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do is, in some sense, establish in the, in the shadow of realism and your tradition, uh, Patrick, the, the kind of gravitas and a deep-rooted uh, intellectual tradition of liberal internationalism, that it has weight, it has, has a, a significance and a, a real-world impact, for better or worse, uh, across the centuries. To, to be honest about its successes and failures is another uh, thing I think we share, uh, <clears throat> a kind of tradition of criticism of what, get, what, what has been done right, what has been done wrong, what are the sources of, of failure, and uh, hubris and missteps in foreign policy that might get us to Iraq, and then a kind of um, a kind of unearthing of our historical record to to provide a you might call it a usable usable history for American foreign policy today and more broadly global struggles for for world order. And in that regard, I found it particularly useful to go back to a period that I found to be very. Uh, much uh, a kind of uh, early uh, precursor to the period we seem to be in today, and that is the 1930s and 40s, the era of FDR. And uh, I, I've done this because uh, it, it looks like uh, the liberal democracies have found themselves in a in a in a bit of a, a predicament, not unlike they did in that period. When in, indeed in that era, more so than today, uh, there was a real sense of a, a kind of extinction moment, and. Uh, uh, FDR, 
um, it, it plays an important role. He's kind of a hero in my book, and he's uh, he's clearly a, a given a preeminence in this new piece, uh, the, the Rooseveltian tradition and foreign policy. And let me just say, what 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 is that as a subspecies of liberal internationalism? And if liberal internationalism, as I define it, is a tradition of thinking and action, which um, in effect uh, does try to organize international order so that liberal democracies can survive, uh, flourish, um, uh, establish themselves, a kind of that great challenge that uh, that ancient republics and early modern republics had of trying to remain viable in a in a world of of anarchy and power politics that in some sense rescue uh, that central imperative uh, as, as as what liberal internationalism is all about uh, a world safe for democracy not a world to make the not a, a, a program to make the world democratic but to make liberal democracy safe in a very dangerous world and and bring liberal internationalism back to that now wilson and roosevelt are kind of two archetypes in the tradition wilson who had his name on my building at princeton and uh, who is obviously his words are to be the essence of liberal internationalism is uh, clearly a liberal internationalist of a sort, uh, binding together uh, different strands of 19th century internationalism, of free trade and international law and the peace movement. But it's really FDR who, who, um, who, who revolutionizes liberal internationalism in my, my telling. And this is true, I guess, in three ways that he kind of re-centers liberal internationalism. One is there's much more, as we argue in this piece, attention to We'll call them the problems of modernity, of industrial society and interdependence than Wilson uh, acknowledged. Uh, Roosevelt was an early theorist of contagion effects in trade, in military technology. Um, um, uh, uh, this is what he argued in his famous speech to the Bretton Woods con uh, Conference. So interdependence as a managing interdependence as a central problem that liberal democracies in a wider world have to manage. Secondly, uh, and this is something I, I developed and didn't really stumble upon until the end of my book when I was writing it, and that is that in some ways, Wilson saw liberal democracy as a fact of life, growing, flourishing. And so uh, the strategy was to leverage that world historical uh, uh, friendly welcome development, the, the rise and spread of liberal democracy, to make a new type of international order. Roosevelt, in contrast, was acknowledging that liberal democracy was in trouble and wanted to create an international order that would make liberal democracy safe. So it was a, whereas, uh, if you will, to use parla IR parlance, uh, Wilson was a second image theorist, Roosevelt was a second image reversed theorist. He wanted to create an uh, international system that would provide uh, a support a support framework for liberal democracies, and then thirdly and finally, then I'll I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, there was a, um, a a sense that to make states behave in this kind of world, you had to create incentives that the old Wilsonian idea of public opinion being the enforcement mechanism based on acting um, in a, 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 according to right in a, the, a, in a kind of world enshrined by international law, that now you had, the, the, the enforcement mechanism would be a club, a kind of liberal order, which had boundaries, barriers to entry. And to get inside of it, you got benefits, but you also had a kind of logic of conditionality. You had to buy into a suite of purposes. So for those reasons, Patrick, I, I think that Liberal internationalism um, from the age of the mid 20th century has something to say to us today, and we'll hopefully get into that in, in our discussion. Thank you, John. Well, and uh, congratulations on your Fourth of July article, Doctrine. And I think you start with the right question, which is, and one I'm troubled by, which is the interrelationship between. <laughs> disarray abroad and disorder at home, the, the, and the question of how, how can a constitutional republic 
survive in an anarchic, dangerous world. And the, the symbiosis between those two things, which, which for me, and I'm, I'm sure for you, was brought home particularly on the 6th of January, when at the very time that America is still standing sentry in Afghanistan, there are rioters looting the Capitol. There is something going wrong there. I don't think those two things are coincidences. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly struck by the centrality of, of Roosevelt now in your, in your thinking that um, you're, you're working at an institution where suddenly Wilson is, is uh, shall we say, a contentious figure more than before. He's being torn down. Uh, but where Wilson also, in a sense, embodies some of the problems of liberal, liberal internationalism, that as well as a noble vision, which I think you share, of, of an enlarged progressive sphere in which democracy can thrive, there's other things he got up to, like the racial bigotry, the authoritarianism, the scorning of checks, constitutional checks on his authority, the regime change adventures and wars, etc. And so we move, in a sense, to Roosevelt, where there's a, slight, there's a different proposition here. Um, so this, this made me go back and read my old notes about Roosevelt. And I guess, and this is the, as a point of entry, I also admire Roosevelt, but for me, he's a very, he's a canny, duplicitous, slippery, ruthless rail politicker. I mean, he's, he's other things too. Roosevelt is a mixed bag, right? He's, he's, he can't be reduced to one thing. And one of the questions you ask, and you and Dan ask, why isn't there a Roosevelt doctrine? I think there's a reason for that, that Roosevelt deliberately didn't keep records. He deliberately kept himself ambiguous, that he didn't want to be pinned down too much. He, was, he prized flexibility. Uh, and so the achievements of Roosevelt, to me, are partly come on the back of some very dark bargains. In other words... In your article, you talk about the kind of the sunny upside of liberal internationalism, progressivism, you know, the building of institutions, the, the pursuit of international cooperation, um, uh, the importance of alliances and institution, institutions, etc. But for me, Roosevelt's achievement and in a sense America's achievements after 1945 and their substantial Typically, come on the back of doing great betrayals and terrible things, or at least very agonising compromises, lesser evils, if you like. Um, I mean, Roosevelt may be the may be the figure who presides over the Atlantic Charter. He may be the one who pronounces on the four the four freedoms and the forerunner of the, inst the institutional architecture that we live in now. But he's also the Roosevelt of Yalta. And he's the Roosevelt who, uh, uh, in fact, authorizes America's biological weapons research program. And not that I'm a fan of that. And uh, he's the one who says to the U.S. ambassador, I think, in Rome, uh, when he's asked if he's got a problem with the dictatorships in 1937, he says, of course not, unless they move their, across their frontiers and make trouble in other country. Uh, He's the one who makes accommodations with French colonialism in Vietnam. Uh, he's the Roosevelt, uh, and speaking on this side of the Atlantic, who very ruthlessly dismantles, helps to dismantle the British Empire and downgrade British power. That's not me complaining, by the way. And in some respect, by doing so, he does Britain a favour uh, by turning our allies into satellites and containing them. And, of course, he's the Roosevelt of great duplicity. He's the one, when he's presented with evidence about the Katyn massacre, that he will pretend not to believe it. Even if, even though the evidence is compelling, um, so a power seeker, who and oh, and also, of course, how can I not mention this? What we know from historians like Robert Kimball or Robert Devine is his belief that international institutions are useful forums for legitimising American power and for creating order, but that, that America must not be bound. That the General Assembly, for instance, is there to let smaller powers blow off steam. Um, there was a wonderful quote from. Uh, Robert Devine, FDR occasionally, quote, let the mask fall to reveal his own commitment to a great power piece. And that great power piece, which sounds nice, involves effectively looking the other way behind the Iron Curtain as Stalinism locks itself down and becomes deeply repressive. Why do I say all this? It's not because I think the United States is a scoundrel. In fact, I 
share with you the belief that in general it's the most benign hegemon the world has yet seen. It's that I, I have a very harsh view of what the world is and what the, the anarchic pressures of the world are they, as they bear down on states. And it's inescapably imperial, that is, trying to constrain other sovereignty to pursue your own interests. And the question is how prudently and how well or badly uh, one responds to that. And that, I think, as well, as you say, uh, contains a number of vital questions for Joe Biden. That's rather a long opening. But No, that's not. I, I, that was very good. And in some ways, you both made a, a sobering uh, reflection on FDR, but you also answered why he might have been that way. I mean, you, you ended by saying that uh, uh, the world is a, you know, is a place uh, uh, riven by hatreds and anarchy and tyranny and uh, a, a, a true liberal peace in some kind of ideal form is, is beyond the reach of even enlightened statesmen. Uh, so mm -hmm. you kind of answered your question and I, I don't disagree. I, I, I think uh, uh, that all that you said is true. I, and, you know, there's the, the FDR who, who, who heard about the, uh, what was we later to be called the Holocaust, uh, and he, he didn't uh, approve bombing of rail lines. Uh, there's, of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the treatment of Japanese Americans in the internment yeah. camp. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of uh, dirty hands here. And, and in, as one who's been looking at liberal liberalism and liberal internationalism across the eras, this is something that uh, some of us who are sympathetic to the overall, call it world historical project, and in some ways what I hear you saying is that you are too, because part of your critique of FDR is he wasn't liberal enough. <laughs> he should have been more, more so. He, he, he turned his eyes away from things that... No, 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 that's liberal. not... A no, no, no. I, I, I don't complain, and I'm not necessarily complaining about any of that. Um, okay. But, uh, but anyway. what, I, what, what is is absolutely true is that that all of these figures, and indeed our generation, uh, uh, have, have will for, will also, in some sense, fall short. And and from yep. the the uh, the very beginnings of liberal democracy, the original sin of slavery in the American case, the 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 unfolding nature of uh, liberal democracy and liberalism as a work in progress in both senses a work in progress and a work in progress uh sense that uh there's always a kind of doing what you can to advance uh the the project to 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 look for ways to uh of, of for pursuing human betterment greater freedoms the spread of rights and protections, knowing that that uh, it's always going to be incomplete, and you're always working with others along the way. I would say that FDR, more so than Wilson, uh, had a kind of enlightened sense of the world, the kind of a more a, a, a broader a kind of a his, his moral vision was broader than than Wilson's. He he, he was troubled by European empire. He did. Yeah. Uh, 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 aggravate uh, Churchill time and time again. After the fall of Singapore, he urged on Churchill uh, the granting of Ind Indian independence because he saw that those in the Philippines who were given the promise of, inter inter of independence fought harder than the Indians who were under the thumb uh, of, 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 of Britain. So there was a, a, a kind of uh, post-imperial vision, a kind of moral vision that 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 Churchill was that 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 Roosevelt was searching for was reaching for it is in the Atlantic Charter, uh, it is at the, in the Four Freedoms. Um, I, I think uh, uh, there there is a a sense that that uh, that that it was a order building project. Uh, read the diaries of Mackenzie King, who, uh, to my surprise spent weeks upon weeks during World War II at the White House um, with late night conversations with, with FDR. And he would go back to his room and he'd write about what, what they talked about. And uh, uh, you get uh, from his clearly sympathetic uh, reading and recording of FDR a real sense of, of that this we can't simply win this war, that it's not simply a geopolitical conflict between power centers. It's a 
it's a struggle for the world in some sense. Uh, and he used the term uh, states that are, are, are uh, gangster states. Uh, there was a, 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 a pretty strong ideological dividing line that you saw in the, the Four Freedoms and the Atlantic Charter, partly prompted by the fact that, that, that um, Hitler's uh, Germany was itself pumping, pumping, uh, pumping out propaganda that, that Roosevelt felt he had to, to, <clears throat> to counter. And this is kind of just an analytic point. It seems to me that in liberal democracies going to war, and this goes to your point about how can a, a war of a world of war and geopolitical struggle be reconciled with polity principles that we associate with republicanism or liberal democracy. And in a strange way, there it's not all a zero sum. The more global struggle, the less uh, uh, good fortune for domestic liberal principles. It actually is more complicated than that because it was partly the geopolitical struggle with fascism and totalitarianism that led FDR to kind of raise the ideological stakes. We're not going to simply win the war. We're going to make a better liberal, more liberal world on the other side of the war. So a kind of uh, 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 inflation of war aims that liberal democracies find themselves time and time again engaging in because they've got to legitimate war to a, a an electoral citizenry. Uh, and so yes. you have to uh, provide this broader kind of agenda, and that works to the advantage of the liberal project. Up to a point, and I think one one area where we have where we put different weightings is, I think, agency and structure here. I mean, you're very, you're very right that Roosevelt did articulate at times a very elevated conception of what the war was about, partly to mobilise people. But then what happens when the Red Army turns up with the guns uncontested in, in well, throws out, throws out the Third Reich, throws out the worst thing the species has ever seen, but introduces a pretty vile totalitarianism of its sort in, deep in the war when the British Empire is struggling to, to breathe and America is concerned about limiting the war and maintaining domestic consent. The proposition then is you may want to elevate the principles, but do you accept de facto Red Army occupation in the hope that it will soften or not, but not try and resist it. And in other words, it's not that there aren't preferences. There are preferences, but there are other preferences which are forced. The, the, the dynamics of the system bear down, which is you may want liberal values, but you also want stability and peace. And when those things lock horns, Roosevelt makes a pretty clear decision. Um, the, the high tones of the of the Atlantic Charter wash up against the, the the fortress walls, if you like, of Stalin's empire. Understandably so, I think. Yeah. I mean, and on this question of um, another another point of, of difference, I'm more worried, I think, than you are about the domestic costs of projecting power abroad. It's not that you don't project power abroad. I'm no, I'm no hide under the mattress guy, although I would get out of the Middle East. But... Roosevelt in projecting power abroad does help to set up what becomes the national security state. Uh, the rationale that you have to project power in the world of violent interdependence to remain free comes at a price and, in a sense, sets, sets the scene for Vietnam. I mean, all of the things you and Dan wrote also can very easily feed the logic of fighting a war in South Asia in order to demonstrate your alliance credentials to other democracies in the world to show that you're serious. And the war on terror, which at times I think does become a, a partly an attempt to transform the world, um, comes with the Patriot Act and all of the wickedness that flows, as well as not just torture and rendition, but the sidelining of Congress as part of foreign policy. In other words, the anxiety, one, one anxiety from where I'm sitting is that trying to spread democracy abroad, or at least even trying to create a world that is hospitable in a progressive way to democracy can then also undermine it at home. Um, and which then taps into an alternative American tradition, the exemplarist one, that you, you build the great republic at home. You don't, you don't stay away from the world. You do project power in the world, but you do it on a much more hard-nosed basis of balancing of power than an over-concerned with things like regime type. 
Um, and I think this raises questions for Biden today, and we'll, we'll come on to it, but I think there is a question before the Biden administration which has not yet been resolved. I think there is an argument going on within the Biden administration about just how much he should ideologise foreign policy around democracy or prize stability. In a sense, in a less dramatic way, the very choice that confronted Roosevelt in World War II. Yeah, I think I think I we, I don't totally disagree, and I I am troubled by the national security state, and uh, I I don't you know the kind of the the, the grand tradition of liberal internationalism doesn't uh, celebrate that. It, in fact, it it it, uh, it tries to build a, 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 a sort of articulated agenda of 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 kind of critical mass liberal democracy, where where the sheer kind of weight of like minded states bound together in various ways creates a, a sufficient kind of stable peace so that you're not constantly fighting wars or uh, uh, you're not constantly um, um, uh, uh, engaged in military interventionism. Uh, but it's, it's, it's absolutely true. And one of the, uh, just the sheer kind of realities that, that all schools of foreign policy have to deal with is that there are these tragic choices. Uh, yeah. You engage in in real realist style balancing and uh, uh, partly to uh, push back dark forces that can imperil you. But in doing that, you are cutting corners. You're you're empowering the state to wage war or to engage in extended deterrence. Uh, you're basing uh, your troops around the world. It is a uh, it is definitely a, a balancing act. Uh, Liberal democracies are constantly making these choices. Just in, within the liberal imagination, you are balancing principles that aren't that don't quite fit together: liberty and equality, uh, individualism and community, sovereignty and interdependence. It's all a constant balancing act, and it's the, it's. Uh, I think we're out of balance today. I think we we've uh, we've moved in in a direction that has undercut the. The, 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 what are understood in earlier generations, the benefits of liberal democracy. We have to reestablish that we can operate as open societies in an open world. And I, no other uh, set of countries in world history have done that before. It's, it's always failed or even, for most part, never even attempted. So liberal societies in an, uh, in an, uh, or open societies in an open world system, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fraught, <laughs> And uh, uh, it's my, I think maybe our only difference is that I think we've done a better job than you acknowledge, and it's worth trying. I would put it this way. I think um, to the extent that one can do a good job in an anarchic world, the U.S. very often has, but, but by doing it, by doing some things that often don't turn up in the in the liberal restorationist mm -hmm. literature, which is so thriving now, particularly in the era of Trump and Biden, because we live in a time of restorationism politically, right? Everyone's probably, including myself, wanting to bring something back, right? The restoration is the thing, and it's if it's not making America great again, it's um, uh, take back control or bring back the Rooseveltian vision or bring back Machiavelli, all sorts of things. Um, for instance, one of the go-to examples in this literature is Germany and post-war Germany and Japan, um, as the kind of uh, as the premier cases of of constructive internationalism, turning what had been uh, fascist predatory states into proud social democracies, or at least at least helping helping them to do so. Uh, when I read that, and maybe this is just because I'm always looking to the darkness, um, like that Brad Pitt character in Fury, who says ideas are peaceful, history is violent. I mean, Emperor Hirohito, for example, studiously protected and bodyguarded by the MacArthur, by the MacArthur uh, proconsulship, where his actual complicity in Japan, Japan's war crimes is covered up and not talked about, and he's not prosecuted, so that they can create a legitimising ceremonial figurehead in Tokyo in which democ Japanese democracy can again take root, right? Now, that's that to me 
I think on balance is is worth it. But my goodness me, that's that's rough stuff. When 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 the I think the the, the documents are still under lock and key uh, about what they had on Hirohito and his deep involvement in in what some people have called uh, Asia's Holocaust. So um, in in some respects, it's a disagreement about means. By what means are we creating a better world? I also think it's to do with things that are, aren't just to do with America's benevolent statecraft, things like nuclear weapons, like the nuclear revolution fundamentally altered the world. They obviously require careful handling and systems and prudent measurement and diplomacy and all of those things, absolutely. But uh, changing the equation fundamentally so that, uh, contrary to Roosevelt's vision, it wasn't just America with a monopoly in the end, but actually that there was resistance and there was proliferation. And the net result being, as well as some very dangerous moments, a more stable world between major powers than there might have been. Um, so this then raises the question, uh, what kind of choices lie before America now? And here's one area where I think there is a real, there is a trade-off, a painful trade-off here, which not enough is being made about of, which is on climate change. If we're going to say that climate change is a or the defining challenge of our time, as some argue, uh, whereas, as well as that, in your art, there's a commitment to democracy and to democratic solidarity and things like that. I think there is a direct collision here that if we're serious about reducing carbon emissions, for example, as the Biden administration has said it is, but if we're serious about democracy and human rights, at some point something's got to give there because you're dealing with large Asian states, which are either, some of which are either dictatorships, in the case of China or increasingly illiberal democracies like India, and you're wanting to get meaningful action and bargains on climate change, then you're probably going to have to ramp down the emphasis upon uh, ideological convergence, democratic reform, human rights, or vice versa. Uh, and actually, I think what's going on at the moment is something quite interesting. So it's, oh, sorry, go on. Go actually, on. Is your view that if... The United States raises questions like how Beijing is treating the, the, the young people in Hong Kong or the, the Uyghurs in Western China, that China will then decide it won't uh, be serious about climate change? Isn't that kind of saying, if, if, if you criticize me, I'll shoot myself in the head? Isn't it in the there, China's interest to do it whether there's an ideological struggle going on or not? Uh, it may be objectively so, but I think it's going to be harder to negotiate if, if the emphasis is upon um, effectively regime change, in, internal regime change. I think uh, you talk about, for example, the arms control agreements, the, the uh, cooperation in global public health between the US and the Soviet Union in World War II, oh, sorry, after, during the Cold War, but that came mostly at moments when there was greater stability and greater mutual restraint. Um, I mean, my fear with China is that actually uh, uh, by, by, conceding, by conceding a lot of things for China in order to get it to move on, on climate change, it may not cooperate anyway. But I think there is a problem here that of priorities. In other words, most people in Washington, D.C. are in favour of climate emissions reduction, most of them are in favour of democratic reform. It's, it's when the things come into collision. But they're being spoken of as though they're of a piece, as though they're harmonious. Now, China may say, I'm not an expert in this, but it may, it may say we want action on climate change, but on our terms, not on America's terms. And they, they can be very different things. But who's going to move first? Who's going to take, who's going to make sacrifices, etc. And quite as much as anything else. And you and I agree that the US should lead a balancing coalition against China's bid for Germany and Asia. But that's going to involve cooperation with some pretty despotic, pretty unpleasant states as well. Ramping up emphasis upon um, liberal ide ideology is going to, I think, put a strain on that. For example, the well, likes of I, Vietnam or Thailand. I, I, I see the point, and I understand the, the, the possibility of a, a kind of trade-off here, uh, but not entirely. Uh, I, I, let me just sort of Mm -hmm. say I would kind of frame it slightly differently. On the one hand, I do think that China has an interest in 
climate change, if, 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 if a regime is threatened by uh, environmental problems, it's China more than anybody else, from what I hear, the reports of, of, of domestic uh, protests for dirty water and, and climate change related uh, uh, degradation in, in the environment uh, is, is pretty, a pretty a hot topic there. So China's regime has a, a self-interest in, in getting over this and in, in making progress. And secondly, to the extent there's competition with the, the, the other model for the world, the liberal democratic model, and China can show that it has a pathway to uh, low carbon or carbon zero um, uh, uh, economic development, it, it, uh, is, that's a kind of a key to the 21st century that they would want to grasp if they could. And so too, uh, the liberal democratic world. And so in one sense, I think, uh, the liberal democracies see, seeing their challenge as, as, as showing the world that, 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 that kind of, of, of polity, that the liberal democratic world can solve problems, can, can uh, uh, take take hold of this problem and and make progress in a way that 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 is consistent with their their values and institutions that that that's good for China as well and 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 uh, so a kind of uh, constructive competition uh, and I don't think um, full throated geopolitical Cold War competition is going to ha- happen partly because. Um, uh, America's allies don't want to do that. Uh, Germany, not least, uh, they, there's trade here that, that's at stake. And, and as Dan and I argue in our piece, uh, these, what we call the problem, what I call the problems of modernity, these interdependence problems where you do need to have countries simultaneously working together on these problems. So too on pandemics. Uh, uh, that is, as you say, important uh, as an independent line of American foreign policy that gets threatened by simply devolving everything into great power competition. I, I've never subscribed to that view. I, no. I do think that we are in a contest for the world. I do think that China is uh, attempting to uh, fashion alternative vision of modernity and how state socialism uh, um, can, can be a kind of model that, that, uh, that over, overtakes the Western model. I, th- this is clearly in, in, in President Xi's imagination. So there is something deep at stake, uh, not just about territory and realist kind of struggles. My, my point to you is that the liberal international tradition has a DNA, an intellectual DNA that does grasp this, these notions of interdependence, which you are emphasizing now. And I'm just Curious, how does classical realism provide any intellectual guidance for you? Uh, it seems to me you have to s- step out of your cherished uh, academic uh, tradition to make arguments about what the world needs to do uh, in the area of climate change, pandemics, uh, 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 more intensive international institutionalized inst- in- in- international institutions. Where where do you, uh, institutional cooperation, where do you get uh, the intellectual inspiration for your, your, your policy agenda when it comes to these 21st century challenges? So, so the, the, point, the point that I was sort of working off there was not so much me saying climate change is, is the most important thing. We have to sacrifice everything for it. To the contrary, what I was, what I was noticing was a treatment of a number of things that are valued as though they're harmonious, when in fact I think I see them as much more directly in in, in, com- in tension with each other. Uh, that the commitments, as the, taking the your own article uh, and wider body of work, and the Biden administration and what they've been saying, uh, particularly uh, Anthony Blinken uh, amongst others talking about the importance of a rules-based liberal international order, about the importance of democracy, the importance of allies, the importance of, ally, of, of work on climate change, as though these things are naturally in harmony. Now, you may be right that objectively speaking, that's true. There's a harmony of interests there. But but I think in order to, if you actually, if those are the things you care about, the world will force you to make painful choices that I'm not sure we're ready for. And 
I think in some respect, liberal internationalism makes it harder to get ready for those choices because, because it, it has, it has a, a, a worldview uh, which de-emphasises the clash between those things. I mean, my view is that actually we do overstate interdependence on, on many fronts and that an emphasis on interdependence all the time actually leads America into a lot of wars it doesn't have to fight. And the, the searching for a security link with everything has led to the last few, has helped to lead for the last few decades into not just wars of blood and treasure, which have taken up everybody's time in Washington, D.C., where there are very other, very important things to talk about, from Wi-Fi poverty to um, opioid addiction at home to uh, to the very serious uh, power struggle going on in Asia. Um, I mean, my, my tradition is, in a sense, my tradition, the tradition I admire is more sceptical and has the higher threshold for what truly affects you and threatens you and what is just desirable. Um, but well, this, uh, sorry, go on. No, I, uh, fair enough. I, I just would just in defense of, of liberalism, and this is the argument that Dan and I make in the paper. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's in my book as well, by taking the long term, you see that the, the liberal project, liberal, modern liberalism is constantly reinventing itself for new circumstances. So think of a, a 19th century liberalism, laissez-faire right. liberalism, leading to what the British call reform liberalism, the, the, the U.S. Uh, progressive era liberalism, the great society, or the, the New Deal, great society. Uh, uh, along the way, in each, each era, industrial society, interdependence, the, 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 the problems and prospects of modernity are forcing liberals to to ask the question, how can we stay true to our values of open, uh, accountable, uh, 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 limited state constitutionalism, freedom of, you know, elevate individual rights, freedoms and protections, and do so consistent with these pressing uh, transformations of industrial society brought on by modernization? Uh, and and that's, that was FDR's path to, to reinvent the liberal state for a new era. And I kind of think that's what Biden is trying to do. He may not succeed, but, but the, the ideas of linking, um, industrial policy, uh, climate friendly technology, R&D, um, jobs programs, uh, uh F, FDR's, uh, conservation, um, Civilian Conservation Corps was an ingenious way of, 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 of making good on the liberal uh, uh, value uh, traced back to, to Teddy Roosevelt of, 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 of preservation of, of forests and la- public lands with jobs programs and uh, new ways of, of connecting uh, uh, citizens to the public wheel. So I think... Uh, that's something that F, that Biden has in mind as kind of trying to learn from or take a leaf from the FDR playbook. Uh, it's very much a domestic story of of updating liberalism for a new era. A- again, it will entail some kinds of uh, trade offs. Everything does, but but it seems to me that that's the vision of trying to do what FDR was able to do in his era, which is combine these things. Uh, in a way that that uh, allows us to preserve our, our our valued institutions and ideals, but adapt them to new realities. Which raises a further problem: to what extent that that presupposes and depends upon American primacy in the world, right? So there is a slippage here between the pursuit of of a liberal order that's friendly to democracy and American primacy, American global leadership, which is the term I think you term you use. Um, and one of the problems here is that the world that Biden has inherited and is dealing with in some, in, in many respects is so fundamentally different. And I'm not even, I'm not talking about the technology or the clothes or the manners or the, or even the beliefs. I'm talking about the balance of power that the United States in world war II eventually inherits the world where its main adversaries have destroyed each other and its main allies are exhausted and shattered. Um, it is, it is the, it is the, it is the superpower that has for a time an atomic monopoly. It is the world's greatest creditor. It is the world's industrial home. 
uh, producing the you know the great industrial miracle of World War II, uh, a ship every day and a tank every five minutes. Um, it's the one that everyone wants the patronage of. Very confident, and I don't mean to, mean to minimise America's sacrifices in World War II. That, I mean, for the people involved, they were heartbreaking, but relative to all the other countries, it has suddenly ascended to global primacy at a relatively low cost. It has a freedom of manoeuvre and a canvas on which to paint that Biden does not have. And I think Biden realises this. I'm, I'm One of the reasons I have a sneaking regard for Biden is that just occasionally there is a prudential Biden that kind of peeps through the clouds that... You know, his, his quarrel with Richard Holbrook over Afghanistan and the limits on America's moral duties there, um, his scepticism about the Libyan adventure in 2011, uh, his desire to hire Matthew Rajensky to the NSC against huge opposition. In other words, I think uh, along with all of the kind of things you're talking about, the kind of domestic revival stuff, he does realise that America is, we're living in a world now, America has to focus as it's never focused before, because this is the first time in which America has been a great power, but not uh, of the kind of stature that it was for a number, during a number of unipolar moments after World War II. Right, and right. Absolutely. So, so that, and I think he, and this is different to I think some of his advisors and some of his ministers realise is actually, he, he won't quite say it, but whilst focusing upon um, checking China's bid for hegemony in Asia. There's a need to have an entente with Russia, a dialogue with Russia, bilateral agreements, which he's cautiously feeling towards, and drawing down, if not withdrawing from the Middle East. And he's doing this in creeping steps. He's doing it cautiously. He's got a great eye, as FDR had, for what is possible domestically, politically. But I think, in a sense, he's at war with his own administration or some of his advisors who have, some of them, frankly, have an almost McCarthyite view of any kind of cooperation with Russia, um, which I think is very harmful. I think if, if you have an interest in competing with China in a clash of systems, then we're trying to find ways of wedging, driving a wedge between China and Russia to prevent that thing that America has been struggling for years to prevent, that is a Eurasian hegemon coming together and not being embroiled in a region where America turns out to have not that much influence, but it pays huge costs and is burdened all the time. And as we saw recently uh, in, the, in the crisis in Israel and Palestine and the West Bank and Gaza, America has the worst of all worlds. It's complicity without much influence. But Biden realises these things and he's trying to deal with it. But like Roosevelt, he realises that to, to do rail politic, you have to do it in an American accent. Well, I I think uh, I think there is that, that we that the United States is in a, a in a world where its power you know may not be what it used to be. Although I would urge you not to be too nostalgic about America's power in the past. To use a term you enjoy, uh, uh, the U.S. was powerful after World War II, but it was not all powerful, and uh, it was not all liberal democratic. Uh, uh, think of Spain. Uh, uh, Portugal, mm. military dictatorships, the huge communist parties in Italy and France, yeah. uh, uh, the Suez crisis. There's an incredible uh, story of, 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 of mixed outcomes uh, based on American uh, primacy during that period. I do think that where I start, if I were to accept your premise that it's not quite like it used to be. It, that, for me, a fortiori gives me a reason to want to bring uh, like-minded states together, which all along, I think there's a certain misconception that American grand strategy in the 40s onward was a, a, a kind of singular uh, U.S. Uh, kind of, a, it was unipolar bef uh, before unipolarity emerged. It was, it was a uh, first among equals, it ran the show kind of Role when there was a lot of coalition, uh, uh, coalitional politics. There were bargains. Uh, Germany and France uh, were uh, uh, partners. There was a, there was a sharing of the spoils of modernity. There was incredible kind of international institutional interconnections and reciprocity and working together and and three kind of moments. Uh, so that. That DNA of, of coalitional 
politics among the liberal democracies is precisely what this moment uh, demands. Uh, we are we are stronger together. If Europe and the United States and Japan and Korea and your country Australia uh, stand together, they will. Uh, they, they are still kind of a critical mass that can drive the reform of institutions, can make sure that standards and practices of international order uh, have a liberal democratic friendly uh, tilt to them. Uh, so I, I, I think where Biden has it right, and it's premised precisely on his sober as opposed to hubristic uh, assessment of liberal democracy and its prospects or American power and its prospects is, we, you know, we've got to be together. You know, Benjamin Franklin, as he told his fellow 13 colonists uh, in, in 1776, we will hang together or we will surely hang separately. I, I think this is a moment when, uh, when, when, when we, we make a decision whether what kind of world we want to live in. And if we, if we want to live in, in one that has a kind of framework that uh, that is uh, uh, that allows for liberal democracies to cooperate to protect themselves to leverage their 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 aggregate resources and capacities um, that can welcome countries that want to move in that direction that want to bandwagon with them rather than balance uh, I think that's where you start it, it, as you say it, it the the danger of course is and Moscow and Beijing feel this, that a successful and thriving liberal democratic world is threatening to, to autocratic states because they're worried. The great threat to Putin and Xi is a citizenry that, that demands rights. And as long as countries in the world that have polities that give citizens rights are doing well, it's 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 a structural threat. It's not a regime change threat. It's not uh, Cheney and and Rumsfeld plotting to intervene in Beijing or or, or or Moscow. It's just world historical developments are going to be unkind to autocratic states who are deeply threatened by their own people. And I don't think that that that's a big enough excuse for us not to be proud of living in societies that that enshrine those rights and want to protect them and make them greater than they were before and extend them to people who are still struggling to feel like they get they have those rights uh, to reckon with our past to make it a better polity to 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 tell the world we we know we we don't have all the answers but we know where we want to go and and so i i just think that that this is a moment like the 30s and 40s where We've got to say things like this. I, as international relations scholars, we didn't have to make those kind of arguments 20 years ago, uh, but but today we have to. We do have to sort of ask the question: what What kind of world do we want to have out there for our uh, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren? Do we want to see if there's still a possibility that open societies can exist in an open system? And I think the jury is out. But well, I would also like not to have a major war, and I think there is a real danger in tilting too far to a belief that in order for for the republican constitution democracies to be secure and and to thrive, they have to expand or replicate that system. And I think that one of the problems here is that whilst we may like to think that we have benign intentions about building and 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 consolidating democratic renewal that has come historically with the accumulation of enormous power and if from moscow's point of view the oncoming of a euro atlantic world that if you've had their history and all, almost every major power has a memory of predation including america including china it can look very threatening and uh in other words we have to try and empathize with those we including those we don't like as well as the, the citizenries that we do admire. Um, and I, I actually wanted to ask you a question here. Um, your work, I mean, your, your book and, and this article, the Middle East doesn't turn up much because you, 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 you emphasise, understandably enough, alliances and those things. Informal and in particular non 
democratic eyes of the Middle East. Where does that all fit here? Because isn't the Middle East the place where a lot of these come into the most violent tension and contradiction? That it's where the US struggles a lot to exert influence. It's where its allies are not only suppressing democratic reform, but in fact, often sponsoring jihadis. Um, uh, and unapologetically often, or even to the point of murdering US journalists, things like that. Where does that all fit here? Isn't it a time in some respects, if the US is to stay there, to start actually not just emphasising solidarity, but starting to throw its weight around and issue some credible threats of abandonment? Well, first, um, as you know, the book um, is, a, is, is arguing that a set of ideas and projects that we call liberal internationalists have come into the world in, in a world that you map quite eloquently, uh, world of the geopolitics of empire, uh, global capitalism, uh, rise and falling uh, hegemonic and imperial powers, and so it's it, it inevitably, and this is my argument, has to make peace with, with those other forces. It doesn't extinguish them. Indeed, liberal internationalism doesn't really even have an ontology. It, it's like a parasite that needs a host. Uh, uh, it, it lands on American power when America is, is, is most, uh, m- most powerful. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't transform America, but it works at least at the edges. And I think even more than that in informing uh, 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 American policy. Uh, we've had our discussion of Roosevelt and, and it, the complexity of his calculations are there to be seen. Um, uh, and in parts of the world, in Latin America and in the Middle East, the United States has acted in a more traditional great power way that, that you, uh, you are quite familiar with. That you, that geopolitics did not begin um, uh, in the Middle East when America became powerful. It, it's, it's been at the crossroads of the world for um, for for a millennia for millennia and it's acted and been the site for great games and contests and probably will for forever um, there isn't a, a kind of regional great power that there is in other regions of the world and so in that sense it does invite intervention and and uh, ge- geopolitical games um, not a lot of great progress from a liberal perspective is there to be had. Uh, and so uh, I, I might be closer to you than to to um, uh, would be interventionists, whether they're realist or liberal uh, alike, to to try to organize things. Uh, I, uh, I I think um, uh, trying to minimize the the downside. I think that that those American foreign policy figures over the last 15, 20 years since 9-11, the Obama years and the Biden years now, I think they they don't necessarily have a lot of great ideas. Uh, uh, I, th- I don't think they're necessarily certain that they've done everything right there. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of worry about how power can be used effectively to to ensure stability and 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 create some opportunity for little little teeny increments of, of progress but uh um i i guess uh, that's kind of as far as i think the liberal international agenda can go i have i have a further question for you um in a sense i feel a responsibility because you and i are the only ones in on this um conversation right now uh what 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 do you say to the radical scholars in particular who take Wilson and now Roosevelt and say that actually what's going on here is, is racial hierarchy, international racial hierarchy, and that while well, Wilson himself a segregationist, Roosevelt, the author of the uh, internment policy, for example, um, the, the allegation that liberal internationalism is complicit uh, in in kind of racist power projection and racial hierarchy and that is that is intrinsic in a sense i mean this is not my own view actually but um i I think it's possible to take parts of history carefully to try and evaluate and that not everything is forever tainted but we do have to be honest about the history where do you sit i mean it can't be comfortable for you with the iconoclasm around wilson and everything like that i mean what do you say about all that 
yeah, there's I, this is something very that's very important to discuss. And uh, in my book, I have a, a chapter on liberalism and empire, and I both concede the entanglement and complicity. Right. Uh, you know, li- our liberal internationalists, when we look at the racial hierarchy and imperialism of the modern era, you know, is is uh, that what we'll call we might call the the crime scenes of the modern world is our liberal internationalists perpetrators uh, um, uh, uh, st- are, they, are they standing by uh, are they uh, are they themselves uh, involved or, or or onlookers what is their their role and in, in some sense they've been in all aspects uh, involved entangled uh, 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 John Stuart Mill made a, a liberal argument for empire, and um, Wilson uh, had a, a narrow, uh, a kind of moral blindness that breaks the hearts of modern liberals. He didn't get it. Uh, he his his vision of self determination, which was revolutionary, uh, um, uh, and had more impact on the 20th century than perhaps any other idea, uh, nonetheless was shorn of. Of, of a kind of enlightened view about race and inclusion uh, and rights. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's there to be seen and has to be reckoned with. Um, I, what, what I would say in trying to, to create a full complex picture of what we're looking at, the standards we're using to evaluate the failures of liberal internationalism are liberal international standards. Mandela uh, embraced uh, those standards. Havel, uh, uh, Gandhi, the, the, the kind of liberal democratic imagination has been the wellspring for the ideas that have been used and deployed against uh, the worst abuses of them by those states who, who often hide behind them and, and enshrine them. So, so uh, thank goodness for liberal internationalism for providing kind of a measuring st- stick for us to draw moral arguments about the world and, and chart a path of social justice. So I, 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 I think there's something there to defend. I also think that when push came to shove, liberal internationalists in the hands of the United States and in the hands, yes, of, of FDR, built an international order that took the world from a world of empire to a world of nation states. Under the auspices of what we call Pax Americana, the world doubled the number of independent sovereign nation states from a little bit less than 100 after 1945 to almost 200 today. And the the U.S. did see it in its interest to usher in a post-imperial world, not always for idealistic reasons. It was actually for reasons of, as a rising state, the U.S. wanted to have access to resources and trade in all regions of the world. Uh, It's so-called grand area needed to be quite grand. It couldn't be an empire in the traditional sense and be a world power. And so post-imperial world order was very much in America's interest. So it wanted to uh, uh, do good and be and do well at the same time. Yes. Uh, so, yet, you, yet you also write, may I, do you mind if I, just, uh, very, yeah, absolutely. You, also say, you also say this though, because the question of empire is a shadow here that follows this argument around. You also say in the article, left-leaning critics who characterize the U.S. system as yet another empire fail to recognize that it is one by invitation. So at times it's post-imperial, at times it's a benign by invitation empire. Well, how do we we reconcile these? I actually don't. That is a term from Gear Lundstock, empire by invitation. And uh, in a, when one kind of, tries to evoke images of what this order is, there's a real kind of linguistic stew that one can draw upon. Uh, Liberal hegemony is the term I've used. Uh, Pax Americana, the free world, uh, the the Pax uh, Democratica, that's Jim Huntley's term. Uh, uh, Dan Dudney, uh, uh, the Philadelphian system. So I, it's interesting, these terms, and, and what they're telling us is that there's kind of an ambiguity, that it's not easy to call it an empire directly. You need to add more terms to it, a 
a, a neo empire, a post empire. There's a sense that it, that empire is not quite right. An American empire. Yeah, an American empire. If empire, two things that 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 would empire in some sense for something to be an empire. I think um, uh, there 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 there. Uh, there has to be some sense that states or polities that are underneath the imperial center have no choice but to be there. And secondly, that they are, uh, so there's no volition, no consent. And so, secondly, that they are in some sense uh, unable to develop mutually advantageous relations with other states outside of that hierarchical system of empire. And in both those senses, the U.S. doesn't qualify as an empire. It overthrows now, quite a lot now, of As a literary government. term, his, historians have a kind of poverty of terms to talk about big structural world developmental patterns. And so they always go back to empire. So, you know, the empire of liberty, the em, which is Jefferson's term, the empire yeah. of tobacco, uh, the, uh, the empire of this or of that. So there is a kind of literary use of the term for big structures. But if you mean it more technically, the U.S. doesn't seem to qualify in the core, in the uh, world that we associate with the, the G7, the trilateral world. The U.S., as I've conceded already, has been has acted in imperial, in kind of crude imperial ways in the Middle East and in Latin America. So we're not disagreeing on that either. But so, oh, I, I think there's something beyond empire here. And that's why the term liberal international order, uh, which apparently Dan Dudney and I invented in 1999 in our article, has been used in ways that some of, that we have not entirely uh, uh, used in our defining essay. Yeah, you you uh, caused all the trouble, so all the trouble you caused. Well, yeah. I mean, so just but a people few. People are few, looking for something. They get a sense that there's something out there. It's complicated. Uh, so a few a few thoughts on the imperial question. Yeah. Uh, firstly, um, I, I'm saying this as someone who thinks that all international politics, at least amongst the great powers, is inherently imperial. So to me, it's not necessarily a dirty word. I think there is something about the pursuit of one's interests abroad where you are deliberately, any great power is deliberately constraining the sovereignty of some others for its interests. That, that that's what I regard as imperialism. It's not all. It's not coterminous necessarily with settler colonialism or annexationist imperialism. And some are more benign than others. And you can be something. You can have other things as well. But to me, all the anarchic system drives great powers inevitably towards imperial behaviour. But I think quite straightforwardly, all the coups. And the interference and the intrigue more than happily qualifies post-1945 America as an empire of sorts, a very American kind. And what I think distinguishes American empire more than anything else is that it doesn't have land hunger. It's, it's different to the Eurasian empires. I mean, quite aside from levels of brutality, and all those different things. Uh, you can talk about liberalism, but America, it's of a, it's a, different, it's a different kind. But when heard of the continental United States was bought from the French. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And the um, other part in the West money well spent. Taken, was, was taken from uh, the Spanish Empire. So indeed. Right, it wasn't conquest, but it is it is a, uh, it was a... Although some conquest followed on. but it, And it was, you know, there was genocide uh, absolutely. along the but, way. Absolutely. But I think a, a power that goes around from time to time overthrowing states, and also there was, I think there was some imperial behaviour in the core, the 1948 Italian elections, for example direct CIA involvement in, in, in fixing the outcome. But secondly, um, the US uh, version of empire um, is, is to emphasize, when, when really confronted with this, I've noticed there's a move you make in liberal international order uh, theorists make, which is to move back to the core. So, well, actually, an Australasia or the G7, but fundamentally, post-1945 behaviour for me is actually doing a lot of things on the periphery in order to shape the core. Vietnam, the, the, great, the great intrigues and struggles throughout Asia or what's known as the kind of the bloodlands, the Middle East, et cetera, North Africa, are done partly 
to shape America's and to bolster America's stature in Europe. So the, those worlds are not separate things. And if America acts as an empire in Asia, Latin America, uh, think of the School of the Americas. I see that Elliot Abrams is back on the scene. Um, it is partly in order to shape its position in the course. So those those worlds are linked. They are, um, they are linked. They are linked. And, in both directions, by the way. It, it, in, in promoting national liberation, uh, supporting yep. democracy groups, freedom fighters, but on the other hand, supporting despots and uh, overturning uh, um, uh, regimes. It's all there. Cold War, the Cold War history is steeped in that. I, I do, I do want to make it clear that no liberal state has ever acted on the international stage entirely on liberal principles. And, uh, and, and the U.S. is as much a geopolitical actor uh, in these realms as any other state. It didn't invent um, coups and uh, uh, subversive interventions uh, and regime change. And so it's not something that the United States invented as a liberal state. It's in some sense, it's, it's been there as a, as a deeper story about great powers and power politics that you have, have quite eloquently and, and, and wonderfully uh, mapped. So I, I, I think it, what we may disagree on is whether the liberal international project has in some sense um, uh, provided a kind of vision of international order that will allow states to move beyond that kind of behavior or not. Right. Uh, acknowledging that that it may well be true that liberal order is built on illiberal foundations. I I I, I I'm perfectly uh, willing to consider that intellectual proposition. Right. But well, I think that becomes also just as much a vital question for allies because there is a sentimentality. I would say a romance in the country of my birth, Australia, and in the country where I live, Britain, and in other countries in Europe and Asia as well, that America is providing order and providing protection because it is a quote unquote friend. And I don't think there are friends in this system. As, as Carlito says in the gangster film, there's no friends in this shit business. There's interests, there's prudence, and there is, there has to be a sense of morality and excess, but there is a kind of self deception about. The, the seeming permanence of America's guarantees, not just because of Trump, but because there is a power shift and because America can't do everything. Um, I wanted to, but I wanted to sort of close off by, I'm not trying to sort of end, the, end the conversation, but I sense that time is defeating us. Um, your sense of, of where, things, where things are sort of headed now um, do, you, do you do you share? I mean, you're closer to this than I am, and you've worked in the State Department, and I haven't. Do you agree with the proposition that there is an unresolved question in the Biden administration now about these issues? That a lot of the rhetoric is consistent, but there does seem to be a like with Trump, but in a different way, a gap between words and deeds here. That tr Trump, if you like, spoke the language at times of. Um, of the 1930s uh, of, of retrenchment, of isolation. But actually, the objective net effect of his administration in many respects was to double down on America's hard strategic commitments. Whereas it seems that Biden and Blinken are talking the language of universal benign hegemony, but in fact, are making rail politic moves. So I'm wondering if you see, that, see it the same way or I'm, am I missing something? Well, I, 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 I think... Uh, I, those have always been coupled together, even during the period we've been discussing. The, the, the post-war era is is full of of realpolitik and and liberal democratic order building, and, and they come together in, in complex ways. Uh, so, so I, I I don't think it's either or. I do think that the, the what what this group of officials believe to their deep into their bones is that. For the United States to succeed on the global stage and be influential and reestablish its authority and help create a, a, a milieu or a, an environment where where the U.S. can can be all that it can be, it, it needs it needs allies and friends, and it needs to 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 give up the the kind of America first unilateralism and, and pugnacious uh, nationalism. Woodrow and, Wilson's phrase, I believe, America first. Well, uh, I, it, it's, 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 it's the phrase of, of, of 1930s uh, 
um, uh, nationalists as well. Uh, so that's, I think, where, where, where uh, Trump got it. Uh, it's the Lindbergh variety of alt-America. It's a term really that does go deep into alt-America um, and uh, that alt-America is still with us. And I think if, if the Biden administration worries, it, it's not so much is are they uncertain about are, do we want, I, I don't think they want, they think about uh, what they're trying to do in terms of primacy or even mm-hmm. hegemony. I think it's building a coalition of like-minded states that can drive the reform agenda. And that can only be done if these states individually and collectively solve domestic problems, problem right. solving. That's problem solving is what we've got to do and whatever that takes. And what what makes Biden very similar to Roosevelt and unlike Wilson to bring it full circle is is that kind of pragmatic. Let's try it. Will it work? If it doesn't work, we'll go on to the next next thing. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's it's, it's it, there isn't a lot of ideology in the Biden administration. It's, what can we do? We've got four years and maybe only four years to do as much as we can to put our, 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 our project, the American project back on, on a firm footing. And uh, we're going to give it a try and we're going to need to, to, uh, to creatively work with others and, and focus on, on problem solving, starting with getting this pandemic behind us to, uh, to kind of a, a progressive growth agenda and finding a way to, push back on on a, a growing China. So the, the words pragmatism and problem solving to me are deeply ideological. So they, they, they see themselves as not that, but they're technocratic language, but it, it comes off, off an ideological base. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to debate Jake Sullivan uh, just before he became uh, National Security Advisor. He's a smart guy. Uh, and he, but he kept on using this term build back better and talking in the, the way you're talking about problem solving. For me, Problem solving and global leadership all presuppose that people agree on the problem and they want to be led and coordinated. In fact, we live in a a world of power politics. There's disagreement about the nature of the problem and disagreement about who should coordinate, who should be led. But it also strikes me that there is, a at the the moment, a confusion around the extent to which there can be restoration. Because if you read the Biden administration's earlier, I think it was a draft national security document, it kept on saying, on the one hand, we can't just go back to where things were. We can't just restore the old world. The world has transformed. But then it kept on also saying build back and kind of American global leadership and primacy. I mean, the most restoration nostalgic thing you can say is make America top of the pile again in the way that it was. I know, of course, I, it wasn't. I think that's, that's a, that misses what the, rest, the restoration of an order that for me was not the, the most important characteristic of the order that some of us would like to save and rehabilitate for the 21st century was an order that yes, the U S was, was uh, the most powerful state in it. And, and indeed still is today, but an order that was defined by uh, cooperation to uh, reopen the world economy after world war II and manage interdependence to find a kind of common uh, geo institutional framework to, uh, to, to, to bring uh, Germany and Japan back in working relationship with the United States to, to link these continents in ways to to create a stable foundation for Germany and France to remain uh, co-leaders of Europe and drive a, a, an agenda as well to uh, provide multilateral institutions so that industrial societies in our era, like in the earlier era, can manage problems of, of growth and interdependence. Uh, and creating a framework so that countries that want to make transitions to liberal democracy like South Korea did and uh, Taiwan and other entities around the world have a, have something to join, something that can provide uh, assistance to them, a kind of home. Um, so these are characteristics of some people call it liberal international order. I would just call it modern international order that um, that is not – ready to be escorted off the stage of history. Um, so restoration of a way of organizing the world, yes. Is it restoration of American primacy or unipolarity? No, I don't think that anybody's that naive, but that wasn't really what made the order tick in the first place. Isn't so, that implicit in the notion of global leadership, John, though? 
there's, there, you know, the order is defined by, you know, the G7 is a form of leadership cooperation. It's that leadership, so G7, maybe a, G, a G10 or a Democracy 10 as a form of leadership. There's incredible variety of leadership. The, the UN Security Council, the G10, the G20, where it's, it's not a single pyramidal order with the U.S. at the beginning. It's a, it's a more, it's, it has more jazz and less Bach, uh, it, it, less classical structure, more jazzy improvisational structure. And by pra- pragmatism, you know, FDR and his advisors walked into the Oval Office in 1933 in the middle of a world economic crisis. What, what, they didn't quite know what world they were in, they inhabited. They didn't know what all, how all the variables interrelated with each other. So they were they would try things, and then if it didn't work, we'll try something else. So you're kind of it's more a stochastic kind of of, of trial and error work. Uh, keep going with things that work. Try things that uh, new things if things don't work. So it's that kind of pragmatism. Yes, there's that's there's a, you can say there's an ideology of pragmatism, but it's a process ideology as opposed to a this is the way it's going to be. Everybody get into line. I think on, we that, should, on I, that note, well, I think you should have your the last word because you've been very generous with with time, allowing me to, to no, go no. On, and on. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, it's it's been a real treat, and a, and I wish we could do this more often. Hopefully, we can do this more often. And uh, I think you've you've asked the right question, and we're talking at a time now where the agony of trying to both repair at home whilst also wage a contest abroad, the agony that faced Roosevelt, uh, is back on the table, uh, and. May the debate continue. Well put. Thank you, Patrick. It's great to see you. If My pleasure, John. And I look forward to seeing us edited online. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Be safe. <laughs> you too. All the best. Good to see you, John. Okay. And stay in touch. Okay.